there are some other, basically I think there's 11, other principles that are deal with the economic principles of value. The first one's called the principle of anticipation. Everything will change. And we have mentioned that real estate works under this thing called the permanence of investment. Land will always be worth more in the future. That is the principle of anticipation. I bought some farmland near a highway 20 years ago, and now that highway is going to build a, an exit ramp because of the population has gotten bigger. That land now is worth a whole bunch more money. So through the permanence of investment, I acted upon the principle of anticipation and bought that land and I held it anticipating the value would go up. The principle of change. Nothing stays the same. The physical property or the economic conditions stay the same. They are constantly in flux and that change will affect the value of the property. Now, in this particular case, it could go down. It could go down. You know, maybe you owned a building in an area of the city that all of a sudden became blighted and now is more run down than it say it was 20 years ago. And the value of your property may have dropped due to that change. The principle of competition. Now, this is a funny one, and I'm going to challenge you right here real quick. I want you guys to think of Wendy's hamburgers. Think of every Wendy's hamburger location that you know of. And I will make you a bet that you cannot name two. And I say two because I don't want you to give me one because there may be an anomaly. But I will almost guarantee you every Wendy's hamburger location that you can find is within one mile of a McDonald's hamburger. Think about it. Because that's what Wendy's business model is. They locate where the McDonald's is and figure that if there's a McDonald's there, they have done the traffic study. They have done the demographic study. They have done all of those studies to determine that that location is good to put a McDonald's in. It must be good enough for Wendy's to steal some of their clients. That's the principle of competition. This happens a lot. You will see this with Domino's and Pizza Hut. You will see it with CVS and Walgreens. You will see it with uh, grocery stores. <clears throat> if there's enough for one of them to be there, there's enough for a second one to steal some of the property. And when Walgreens buys a corner, all of the other three corners value increase because they know that through the principle of competition, those people want to be close. All the commercial owners want to be close, including another pharmacy, all right? The principle of conformity. The more the property looks the same as all of the other property around it, the better value it gets. Now, this is another example of where conformity can actually go the other way. There are some cases where a building may be so unique that it in fact has more value because everybody wants to be there. It's the cool thing right now. It's the chic building. It's the up and coming design, uh, whatever. So conformity, that building could look drastically different and everybody goes, oh, I want to be in that one. All right. So the more it, the maximum value in general is when it is in harmony with all of the other surroundings. The principle of contribution. This is where the sum of the parts or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You know, you may add something to your property like another bedroom. 
at a four car garage. The value of those go up disproportionately to the cost you put into it, right? And this is what every investor wants to do. I want to buy a house for a hundred. I want to add 50 to it. And I then want to sell it for 400 because the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts were together, right? That's what those rehabbers want to do. I want to buy a property. I'm going to add a bathroom and finish the basement and sell it for more than I put into it and made a profit. What is the highest and best use for a property? Now, you can't just say, well, commercial is always the highest and best use. No, because there are things that have to play into this. Is it physically possible for it to be commercial? Is it legally permitted? Meaning is the zoning law. For instance, my house, my personal residence is never going to be a commercial property because I live in the woods in a county in Southern Indiana and that is designed to be residential and no one would ever drive this dead end road to get to a commercial property. So it's, first of all, it's not physically possible. Second, it's not legally. So you can't always say, well, commercial is the highest and best use. It's not true. Now, there are situations um, and we have talked about, or we will talk about, where there are houses along a road that maybe now are small offices like a Remax office or a, a Raymond James office, where it's now more popular to be commercial because the neighborhood has exploded, the road has now become a major thoroughfare, and what was houses 50 years ago are now being used as small offices for an accountant or a single practicing doctor. Well, that highest and best use may be commercial. So the appraiser will take that into consideration when he's doing his valuation. The law of increasing and diminishing returns. The law of increasing and diminishing returns. <laughs> So <clears throat> I'm already choking up because I'm laughing. Um, true story. This is probably my favorite story in the whole wide book, whole wide world. I listed a house several years ago with a client, um, a couple of ladies that lived in a property. And in their front yard, they had 72 lawn ornaments. They had the big gazing ball. They had the, uh, the lady bending over with her bloomers. They had the mushrooms that were different stacks. They actually bragged to me the day we listed that they never have mowed their front yard, that they could use a weed whacker between all of it and do the whole yard that way. So we got a showing on the property and the guy called me and he said, hey, Raymond, I'm going to show your property. And I said, okay. So the next day I called him and I'm like, hey, can I be expecting an offer from the showing that you had? And he said, well, honestly, Raymond, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. We pulled in the driveway, <clears throat> saw their front yard, and then we guessed what the inside of the house would look like and didn't actually even go in for the viewing. So no, we, you will not be getting an offer from us. I'm like, okay, you're right. So I went back over to the house and I'm like, hey, Mary, um, we need to take these lawn ornaments out of the yard because it's too much. <clears throat> and she said, but we like them. I said, I understand. But the average person, it is too much. <clears throat> so week goes by. I get a call from another agent says, Raymond, we want to show your house. So 20 minutes later, he calls me and says, Raymond, have you been inside your listing? You may want to talk to your clients. Now, you know it's a problem when another agent asks you if you've been inside your own listing. So I go back to the house. I knock on the door. I'm like, hey, Mary, can I come in? She's like, yeah, come on in. 
So we got in the house and inside of the house were 72 lawn ornaments. They had moved them inside. And I said, Mary. And she quoted, well, you said to take them out of the yard. I'm like, well, you got me on that one, didn't you? The center, that gazing ball was the centerpiece on their kitchen table. I'm like, Mary, this is too much. So I actually went with them and we went over to Target and we bought some of those big Tupperware things, uh, cabinets, you know, and we packed them all the way. We rode on the side of them. We stacked them in the garage and we sold the house within two more weeks. It is a problem that sometimes too much actually detracts from the property value and people can't see that too much. It is the law of increasing and diminishing returns. You can add too much. You can take away too much. There are people that say, well, you know, I put $40,000 in my kitchen. I've got hard surface countertops. I've got stainless steel appliances. I've got ceramic backsplash. And I'm like, yeah, but you've got vinyl flooring and you've got one bedroom and one bathroom. You have put in too much money. You will never get that back because it didn't raise the value $40,000. So there is sometimes the law of increasing and diminishing returns. And you as the professional may have to help guide them through, hey, yes, let's fix this. But let's not go all out and put travertine tile on the floor in this property because it's not going to raise the value of the property equal to the amount of money that you put in it. All right. Plottage. We have talked about subdivision before. Subdivision is where you buy 100 acres and you subdivide it into a bunch of smaller acres and then you sell each one of those and make a profit. Plottage or assemblage is the opposite of that. This is where you may take two small lots that are side by side and you push them together to make one larger lot and the value of that larger lot is actually greater than the sum of those two lots. This happens a lot in inner cities when they go through regentrification, where they're like, okay, we need to put a gas station down here. So they buy two or three houses on a corner. They push them together, put a convenience store with a gas station, and that value of that land is now worth more than those three separate little houses were. That is called plottage or assemblage. It's the merging of smaller lots. There is this thing called progression and regression. Progression is where a small house is sitting in a bunch of bigger houses. And because of that, the value of that small house has been dragged up a little compared to what the value of that house would have been if it were sitting in a neighborhood of equal homes. Everybody loves to be a victim of progression. Hey, don't you live in that little house? Yes, I do, but it's on Geist Reservoir. Therefore, the value's greater. That is progressing. The opposite of that would be called regression, where the value of a bigger home sitting amongst smaller homes would be brought down a little bit compared to what it would have been if it were sitting in another housing edition of similar sized homes. Progression brought up, regression brought down. The principle of substitution. Now, I will tell you that the principle of substitution is the basis for the CMA. The principle of substitution says, if house A sold for a number, then house B that will substitute for house A should sell for the same number. 
if house A was three bedrooms, two baths, 1,500 square feet, sold for 150, then house B that you're getting ready to list was a three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet, should sell for 150 under the principle of substitution. One will substitute for the other. And then obviously the last and 11th factor is the supply and demand of the current market. This will increase or decrease the value of property. And that's all based upon how many are actually for sale. What are the current amount of buyers that are out there? Is the interest rate high? So the number of buyers have gone low. All of these things affect supply and demand. So those 11 characteristics will affect the value of a property. So now we are going to get into the actual math calculation of how the appraiser will determine the value of the property. We mentioned there are three ways to value a property. So let's get started. So the first method I want to talk about is called the sales comparison approach. The sales comparison approach. In your uh, screen there, you can see in the parentheses, the sales comparison approach would be used with homes that have a history, meaning you can look up e equitable homes on your MLS system, all right? It uses the principle of substitution. It is the entire basis is under the principle of substitution. And there are many factors that you would include. Things like, are there property rights? Is it a fee simple absolute? Were they all cash or equivalent or was it a owner financing? Um, were there other motivation factors? If you notice those things that I'm talking about are the market value. That is the sales comparison approach. 